It is an honor for me to share the Word of God to us again today. And uh, I'd like to, you know, again, uh, share and continue on our series called Redefining or Rediscovering Christmas. But before I get there, um, it's nine days to go till Christmas. Are you uh, ready for the Noche Buenas and the parties? My kids are excited for Christmas. In fact, my daughter, my youngest daughter, would every day, you know, go to our Christmas tree and under it look at the gifts. And every now and then take a peek into what is inside those gifts, shake them, and eager to know what, uh, what is inside those wrappers. And so they're excited, you know, for Christmas. And I'm sure you also are excited. I guess you, who wouldn't be excited? Because wherever you go, you would hear um, Jose Marichan's voice everywhere in this country. You would hear, uh, you know, uh, songs about Christmas, and you would be uh, mesmerized by the decorations in the malls and the scent, you know, of Christmas all over the malls that we go to nowadays. And not just that, but even Christmas lights. Um, here in BGC, I don't know if you've visited it, but we have a lights and sounds display there in High Street. And when you go there, it's amazing. It's in collaboration with, uh, I think, with Pixar. And so that is why when you go there, you will see a huge uh, uh, version there of um, um, Lightning McQueen and the monsters, you know, Mike and Sully. And you will see the Toy Story, some blocks there. That's why when you look at our stoplights now uh, here in BGC, you would see uh, in the, when the light turns green, sometimes it's an alien, the M sign, the Monsters, Inc. sign, or the Finding Dory sign. And... You know, it's, it's Christmas here, and the Christmas lights emphasize it, and it makes us, you know, make, it, make Christmas more fun and more happy. How many, do you appreciate Christmas lights? I mean, I do appreciate Christmas lights, especially when it's, you know, with lights and sounds. And if you go to Miralco right now, um, there in Ortigas, in the Miralco building, they have a light show there as well. They call it Liwanag Park, and um, it's filled with different displays, a showcase of how much uh, electricity they are uh, using <laughs> uh, in Mar and how much they own, okay, and how much lights uh, they have in Meralco. May liwanag ang buhay talaga, okay, there in that building. But it's a nice place to be with, uh, to be in. In fact, uh, my family would frequent that every year, and um, especially if you pay your bills, you're free to go and uh, enjoy the scenery there. Nice to have pictures with your family. We also have a village or a street here in Mandaluyong. Um, I don't know if you visited that, but the lights there, the lights display, wow, they're crazy good, okay? Um, overkill, okay? <laughs> Yung uh, lights nila, okay? So they place lights all over their houses, and it's a beautiful, beautiful street that would make you enjoy Christmas more. They even have this place there um, of... Um, ornaments and Santa clauses. Of course, we don't believe in Santa here. <laughs> but it's, it's making us appreciate and makes us excited about Christmas. That's why a few days ago, I asked my kids, can you imagine Christmas without Christmas lights? How about you? Can you imagine what will happen to Christmas when we don't have Christmas lights? It's, it's something else, isn't it? It's not as happy, perhaps, for us because when we see those um, Christmas lights sparkle and glimmer, I mean, it just brings the kid in us and makes us enjoy the season. And that's why we like Christmas lights. But you know that the originator, the one who started it all, is actually a Christian, a born-again Christian. His name is Martin Luther. And it happened one, uh, you know, uh, on one Advent night when he was preparing for his sermon. And as he was there walking on the street and seeing all these you know, uh, pine trees or evergreens, you know, um, rising uh, there in the, in the background. And he saw the stars because it was, oh, it, the lights were, uh, the, the, the skies were clear at that time. And he would see the stars sparkle, you know, in, in between the leaves of those evergreens. And he thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if we can put all of those lights on the trees? And so that's what he did, gathered his family and, and uh, around their Christmas tree, they placed those candles because they don't have electricity at that time yet. And so they placed candles all around the Christmas tree, you know, um, wired them to the, 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 the leaves or the branches of the tree, and then they lit them, and it was beautiful. Now, since then, since electricity came, you know, people started to put Christmas trees all around, you know, their decorations to signify and to enjoy Christmas. But that time that 
um, Martin Luther placed those candles, it's more than just decoration. There's a symbolism to it. And that symbolism is that Jesus is the light of the world. And it serves as a reminder, why are we celebrating Christmas? Why did Jesus come to earth in the first place? Why, why was there incarnation in the first place? And he said, it is to celebrate and for people to understand that Jesus is the light of the world. Nowadays, when we talk of Jesus as the light of the world, it's something that we know and it's something we see on bumper stickers. But do we really understand it? Is it could it be that, you know, in the midst of the glitter and the sparkle of the Christmas lights all over the city, somehow our understanding of Jesus being the light of the world, the true light of the world, has dimmed over the years? And that is why it is important for us to understand it. And that's why we're taking time to understand what it means to Jesus, for Jesus to be the light of the world. Speaking of light, people have different reactions to light. Um, if you are driving and you're driving at night and you come across people or you, you know, um, or you, you, uh, may mga salubong ka na lights or cars with really bright lights, like to have people, you know, um, um, uh, to, to encounter cars with high beams um, with their headlights, it's something. But then when you encounter people wherein their lights are not just ordinary headlights, they are halogen lamps. Have you experienced, have you seen those? I mean, it's so bright that those lights can be pointed to Mars and it can be seen. Okay, so exaggeration na lang yan. But that, that, ganun ka bright yung light na ginagamit. That's how bright their lights were. And so, if that were you, like me, because I'm a sinner, what I do sometimes is if I get, you know, uh, blinded by those lights, I would also put my, 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 my lights on, on high beam and would say, sige, sila one tayo dito, okay? Let's see who will back down first. Okay, so we get mad as a response to light every now and then. Some people, especially those who are avoiding capture, they run away from light. They don't want to be seen by the light because they know that means capture if they get caught by the light. But for those who are in desperate situations like sailors in a stormy sea, seeing the light in a lighthouse is good news for them because they know as long as they're running or sailing towards that light, they will be safe. Okay? Kind of like the mom, mommy of Aquaman, okay? Went to the lighthouse. For those of you who didn't watch it, okay, uh, you'll get it okay, when you watch it. People have different understandings and people have different responses to light, but my prayer and my hope is that the more we understand what the Bible meant when He said Jesus is the light of the world, that we would not run away from Christ, that we would not be mad at Christ, but instead we will run to Him. And not just one time, but every single day. And so what does it mean for Jesus to be the light of the world? Because this is so important. I mean, this could be a point of conversation in our dinners, in our Christmas parties this year. You can tell them about the origin of the Christmas, the Christmas lights and also about the meaning why those Christmas lights were made in the first place. What is the significance of Jesus being the light of the world? To answer that, we go to John chapter 1. And if you have your Bibles with you, please turn it to John chapter 1. If you have your devices, um, open it and go to John chapter 1. We'll be reading from John chapter 1 verse 1. And I'd like for us all to stand up again as we read the Word of God in reverence to the Word of God. John 1. In verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through Him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. But to all who did receive Him, to all who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. 
who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the Word of God for us today. Please have a seat. I want to highlight a few words in that passage of Scripture for us to understand what it means for Jesus to be the light of the world and its significance to our lives today. But let me give you first a background. The one who wrote this is the Apostle John, and many of us know um, he oftentimes refers to himself as the disciple with whom, Je or whom Jesus loved. He wrote this about 30 to 50 years after Jesus died on the cross, raised again from the dead, and ascended to heaven. And so it was during that time okay, that John finally had a, the, the, you know, the, the grace and the anointing to write the book of John and a few other books, including the book of Re Revelation, when he was exiled in the island of Patmos. But yet in the midst of, or in, 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 the, in that season of 30 years, you can imagine John being very famous in churches. Because he was a first-hand account, you know, of, of um, witnessing Christ. Most likely, a lot of people were asking him, how is Jesus really like? I mean, does he, is he really that kind? Did he really have those holes in his arms and a hole here on the side? And what was he like? Can you tell us more about the teachings? Can you tell us about his birth? And so, Paul, uh, John decided to write this gospel, even though um, Mark and Luke and... Uh, Matthew were already written because he wanted to give his readers and his brothers and sisters a perspective of how he understood Christ is. And John's account is kind of different from the others because for him, he synthesized all the things because he was, you know, looking back now at this time that he wrote it, no? So he synthesized all the things that he knew about Christ and he was the one who actually made one-word descriptions about who Christ is. He said, God or Jesus is love. And now he's saying, Jesus is light. What does it mean for Jesus to be light? The Bible says in 1, uh, John 1 verse 9, He is the true light which give, gives light to everyone, and He was coming into the world. See, light is a concept or a something that we see, something that we appreciate, but yet, not a lot of us can uh, explain and understand. It seems like it's something that it's so powerful, yet so ethereal, and cannot be explained in simple terms. But yet, that's the power of the incarnation. The God who was ethereal, the God who was eternal, the God who is all-powerful, became a man. And because He became a man, we know now who this God really is. His heart, we got to know Him better. And at the same time, we saw how He lived so that we too, through the light that He has shown us, can live lives that are also full of light. Again, three words that I want to highlight. Number one is this one. In the beginning, in verse 1, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus as light, okay, is in connection with this word, Word. Can you say Word. When we say the word word, came from the Greek word logos. And logos, um, it means word, it's an expression of thought, but when it pertains to the Lord Jesus Christ, it means the living word. That it's not just mere words that we're reading, we're reading about a person, and who's communicating to us is also a person. You know, as a tip, when you read your Bible, don't read it as a textbook. Don't read it as a source of information. Read it as a love letter. Because when you know that someone who is so important, so valuable, and loves you so much has a message for you every day, you will read this Bible in a different light. You will read this Bible, um, you know, in a different light, in a different heart. That's very important for us to grow in our appreciation of the Word of God. But logos also um, is the word for uh, the root word for logic or reason. And so for Greek philosophers, they use the word logos to pertain about the meaning of life, the reason for existence, the reason why things are happening. 
And when um, the Apostle John, you know, wrote about God as light and God as word and God as reason, he is saying, you know, for us to have reason and find meaning in life, you cannot find it anywhere else, but you can only find it in Christ. Some people would tell us, in order for us to know why we're made and what's the reason for our existence is to look deep inside of ourselves. John is saying, you don't need to look deep inside yourself. Look to Jesus because He is the Logos, the living Word. And in Him, you can find meaning and fulfillment in life. It is interesting when we talk about meaning and uh, purpose, the context um, of this gospel when it was written reveals also a different facet of the word meaning. John, as I said, wrote this about 30 to 50 years after Jesus' ascension. And at that time, Christianity was not popular. A lot of people hate Christianity. It's not like today where many people would like to be a Christian. In their time, Christians were persecuted. In their time, to be a Christian is illegal. In their time, um, to say that you are a Christian, it could mean and could lead to your death. In fact, Paul, in fact, John, you know, in the course of 30 to 50 years, most likely he has witnessed friends decapitated. He has witnessed, you know, uh, brothers in the faith thrown in coliseums and fed, fed, you know, fed to the lions. He has seen a lot of death. He has seen how the Christians were, you know, hanged on those posts and lit during the night so that they can serve as lampposts on the streets of Rome. And he has seen all of those persecutions. And if you were an ordinary Christian, and if you were wondering, Lord, why are you allowing those kinds of situations to come into the lives of people? Why do bad things happen to good people? I like how John put it. In order for us to have meaning for it, in order for us to still have the faith in the midst of those persecutions, we go to the Word. We go to Jesus because He is the reason. He is the meaning of life, and He is the one in whom, when we have faith in Him, all things will not make sense. May not make sense immediately, but eventually, in our hearts, it will make sense. It's kind of like being in a tunnel. It's kind of like being in a dark, dark tunnel. And sometimes we have this saying, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And when we see the light at the end of the tunnel, it gives us hope. I'm reminded of those who were caught or where they were um, stuck in Thailand in a cave and how dark it was for them for several, was it weeks? Two weeks, right? Two weeks, it was dark for them. And so I can imagine, you know, when, I guess they were asleep when they were brought out of the cave, but I can imagine the guards, the the divers, as they were, um, you know, carrying those boys who were asleep and with those masks, and as they were nearing the the end of the tunnel and light was, you know, um, shining through the mouth of the tunnel, it gives them hope, malapit na, malapit na. In the same way, Jesus is supposed to be like that for us. Jesus is like that for us. He is the light in all of our tunnels. That whatever we are going through in life, whatever season it may seem, whatever dark tunnels we are in with our families, in our workplaces, in our studies, whatever it is, whatever dark tunnel we're in, Jesus can give us the light at the end of that tunnel. He can give us hope in the midst of that. Hebrews put it this way, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith. The more we fix our eyes on the light of the world, the more He will write faith in us when we don't have it, and the more He will perfect the faith in us when, we're, when our faith is dimmering or you know, flickering. In that scripture, in verse 4, it says, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Second word that I want to highlight for us to have a better appreciation of Jesus being the light of the world is this one. It's life. Can you say life? Life. When we speak of life, it came from the word Zoe. And Zoe is not just, you know, being alive physically. Can you look at your neighbor? Okay. Does that person look alive to you today? Okay. Beautifully and um, handsome, alive. Okay. So there's a difference between being alive, being surviving, and also thriving. 
See, some people may be alive, but they're merely surviving. But God's desire for us is not just to survive, but also to thrive. In fact, this word Zoe, it means a real, genuine life. A life that is sustained by God. This Christmas season, what makes you alive? What will make you alive this Christmas season? Is it the gifts? Is it the new car that you will be able to buy? Is it the, uh, you know, the items that you bought from Lazada and Shopee and Zalora that you're still waiting to be delivered that will make you come alive this Christmas? I like how um, Jesus put it. Life does not consist of material possessions. It's not about material possessions. And you know what? If we have Christ in us, no matter if you only receive one gift this Christmas, you will be alive. Parang ayun yata na one gift lang, ano? Gusto nyo many gifts. But again, even if you don't have any gift this Christmas, what will make you alive this Christmas is if you understand that you have the greatest gift of all. And that is Christ's presence in our hearts. His incarnation in our hearts. I like how one pastor put it. The incarnation, God becoming flesh, God becoming man. You know, that happened 2,000 years ago. But every time a person believes in the Word of God, it's like the incarnation happens in our hearts over and over again. The miracle of incarnation, the miracle of faith being born happens in our hearts every time we choose to believe in God. See, God wants us, again, not just to survive but also to thrive. God wants us to enjoy life with Him. God wants us to be sustained by Him and to be enthused by Him. How does it look like? Uh, many of you perhaps have um, tried this experiment when you were little. Have you tried that? You know, planting mango seeds. Have you tried that? Uh, many of us did this when we were in grade one. Uh, we placed some mango seeds in a small um, bottle cap or a cover of a, of a jar with some soil, and then we placed it there. Two days after, we see some sprouts, and a few days after, we see it, become, uh, it becoming longer. But then the more we, it grows, the more we realize that it's always leaning towards the sun. Did you notice that? When you place it near a window, what happens is it does not grow vertically wherein it's pointing to the roof. It's always pointing to where the light is coming from. The reason being is because plants have a tendency. Plants have this ability to contour its body and adjust its body and lean towards where the light is because it knows without the light, it will not be fruitful. Without the light, it will not survive Without the light, it will not grow. Scientists call this, call this as prototropism, the ability of plants to lean towards the light. And you know, as, um, as a natural phenomenon, it also has some spiritual implications. Jesus is the light of the world. And He said because He is light, there is life in Him. But the, ten, the problem is not a lot of people are leaning towards Him every day. In fact, the sad picture is that Christians, they only lean towards God during Sundays. That's not the group here because I know you guys love God, right? I, I heard of some people, um, they would only, uh, some of their friends would only accept their invitation to go to church during um, Holy Week and Christmas. So can you imagine allowing themselves only to be blessed and sustained by the Zoe life of God two times a year, wherein God wants us to experience His sustaining life every day. Not just on Sundays, not just during, you know, um, the 11 a.m. service, not just during your victory groups, but a moment by moment being connected to God and enjoying the life-sustaining grace that He gives every single day. One pastor put it, the challenge in our life today, it's to disengage from this world and to engage with God. We live in a highly connected world. We're so busy that every single day when we wake up, the first thing that we do is open up our phones and see how many messages, how many notifications we have. Is it possible for us to put that down? When we wake up, just put it, put it aside first and try 
to disengage with all of those notifications first for five minutes and just allow God to speak to us and focus your eyes on Jesus and focus on what He has done so that He can impart to us that sustaining Zoe life that is available for us that day. When we do that, something powerful will happen in our day. They say that without light, um, there was also uh, some physical effects on the body of a human being. They call it the uh, seasonal affective disorder, otherwise known as SAD. <laughs> it's true. They made a study of people who um, don't get to experience light or sunlight that often. Um, people who live in places, in countries wherein sunlight is rare in certain seasons. Like uh, the sunlight is very short, especially in wintertime. And it was during those times that, you know, sadness increases and depression increases. The rate of depression increases. And they were able to correlate the sunlight with the, you know, um, the demeanor and the, the emotions that people go through in those seasons. And they say seasonal affective disorder. That's the power of natural life on the life of a human being. For those of you working for the BPO, make sure, please make sure you get enough sunlight, okay, so that you won't be sad, okay? But in the same way, that's what happens to our hearts. That's what happens to our faith when we are unable to connect with God on a daily basis because He is light and in Him there is life. Do you want your life live out of your own sustenance or will you allow the sustaining power of God live in us? That happens when we connect with Him. It says there, in Him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. Have you ever been in a light that, in a room that's so dark? One light, one spark, you know, it gives temporary illumination in the place. That's the power of light. It shines in the darkness. And this is one reason why people are afraid of becoming a Christian, because they're afraid they will get to know all the bad things that they do. That God will expose all of the things, the evil in our heart. And you know what? It is good. It is good for us to experience the light of God shining on us so that we will know what are the things that God will change in us. The Bible says in Psalm, Search me, O God. Search my innermost being and see if there's anything, you know, that um, dishonors you and anything that is detestable to your sight. It is a good habit for us to go to the sunlight. In fact, that's what they do in the natural, isn't it? One way that people disinfect things is if they, you know, um, put them under the sun. And the same thing is true with us spiritually. The more we allow the Christ, the life of Christ and the light of Christ, sh uh, you know, um, shine on us, the more we will be disinfected as well with our sins. I like how it was described here. And the darkness has not overcome it. The light of God gives us hope. The light of God gives us faith. And in it, we can have faith because this light that God um, is about, that this light about Jesus is an overcoming kind of life. It's a triumphant kind of life. If you come to think of it, when Jesus died on the cross and He was placed in the tomb, He actually experienced darkness. He experienced the darkness of the tomb and He experienced the darkness of death. But the powerful thing about Jesus being the true light of the world is He did not remain in darkness. That the power of His light pierced through the darkness of death, pierced through the darkness of the tomb because He was raised again three days after. And because He is alive, all the things that He said to us, all the promises that He said to us will come to pass because He really is God. That is the light that we're holding on to. That is the light that Christ gives. That's the kind of light that darkness has not overcome. In fact, um, a lot of, in, throughout the generations, a lot of things and a lot of people have tried to quell Christianity. They tried to snuff the light out of Christianity, but to no avail. 
Many of you perhaps are familiar with what happened several years ago in a communist nation here in Asia, one of the biggest nation in Asia. And um, when one particular ruler came into power, he said Christianity is bad for his people, and so he banished all of the Christians in the place. All the missionaries, foreign missionaries, he had them thrown out of the country and made uh, Christianity illegal. And so at that time, some... Um, Christian uh, statisticians said there are about 60, 50 to 60,000 Christians left in the place, left to their own without, you know, foreign missionaries. And they presumed and they projected that in a, in a matter of 20 years, Christianity will be zero in that nation. To their surprise, when Christianity again um, had major inroads in that nation, and when they looked how many Christians are there in the early 2000s, they were shocked because the 50,000 bloomed to about 200 to 300 million Christians. All because the light that we serve, darkness cannot overcome it. It is true, and I believe God deserves a hand for that. Amen? It's, it is true historically and it is also true personally. If I give you the mic here and I ask you to share your testimony, I'm sure we can all share about the darkness that we all have experienced. When I look at my own life, um, I still have some friends who get, you know, amazed, either may, amazed or they still ridicule me and don't think that I really am a, a Christian. And I, I, they, they, they still find it funny that I became a pastor. Because when we were in high school and even when we were in college, all the things that I would do then, you wouldn't think that there's a chance for me to become a Christian. Um, in college, when I was in freshman, I was the, I guess, the promoter, the, the starter of sorts, you know, for the drinking parties that we would have in our dorm. Uh, I would be the one to, you know, put all of those al alcoholic beverages in drinks so that it will not be conspicuous. Okay, in bottles, in plastics, as if I'm drinking uh, Mountain Dew or uh, I'm drinking something else, Sprite. Okay? And I would, um, you know, uh, bring it inside their dormitory. And some of my friends then, when they found out that I became a Christian, and now that I'm a pastor, they can't, you can't believe it. Because of the darkness of my past and all of those hang-ups that I had when I look back, I'm just so grateful that not even the darkest, deepest, grossest parts of my soul is beyond the penetration of the light of Christ. See, the same is true for every single one of us. No matter how dark our past is, it is not beyond the light of Christ. No matter how dark our situation is, it is not beyond the light, the piercing light of Christ. And that is why as an application as we close this, and as I ask the music team to get ready, how do we live this out? It's to live by the light, live in the light. Are we living in the light daily? Are we allowing this word sustain us every day? Or are we just like Christmas lights? Patay sinde. Open when it's Sunday, but it's closed during the rest of the day, the rest of the week. I hope that we are allowing the light of Christ show us the way every single day, allowing this word sustain us every day. Number two, we read it in John. John said he was not the light, but yet he was, you know, um, a reflection, reflecting the light of God. After the 9 a.m. service, uh, one of our attendees approached me and shared a very interesting practice that they do as a family. Every Christmas, he said, they have learned not to value the receiving of gifts, but they've learned the value of giving gifts. In fact, he said, he has trained, he and his wife trained their children that every Christmas, what they're looking forward are not the gifts that they would accumulate, but the gifts that they will give to the people in their neighborhood, the less fortunate kids around them. And because they wanted to share the love of Christ in a practical way. And when I heard that, I believe that is an opportune or it's a good example for us how we can be a light.
to this world this Christmas season. We will have parties. We will have gift givings, exchange gifts. I hope that we would use the light in us, the grace that God has given us, the provisions that God has given us to be a blessing to the world out there so that they too will know Jesus is the light of the world. Amen? Amen. Can we all stand up? Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you that you are here, Lord. Thank you that your presence, your sweet presence is here to minister to your people, but also to enlighten. Enlighten our paths, Lord. Enlighten our minds, Lord, so that we would know how to live. As all heads are bowed and all eyes are closed, I believe that the Holy Spirit is moving and He's speaking. And some of us here, we are in a season wherein several decisions need to be made. Year, the year is about to turn and there are a lot of things still left on the air. And I believe that at this moment, you're asking, Lord, can you give me the wisdom how to you know, make the right decisions next year? Give me the, right, the wisdom how to navigate through my business this next year. Lord, thank you that it is you who gives us wisdom and you give it without finding fault. And Lord, thank you that even as they read your word, Lord, thank you that they will experience and they will know about your truth as they encounter you through your words. And so I pray, give my brothers and sisters, Lord, the grace to look into your word for wisdom. And not just look for wisdom, but Lord, thank you that they will encounter wisdom himself. And that is you, Jesus. May we encounter your living word and help my brothers and sisters, Lord, in that situation. For some of us here, I believe that God wants to just enthuse us with life. We are excited perhaps for next year and we see several things ahead of us. Exciting, challenging things. Some of us here, we barely made it through 2018. All of us need the grace, the sustaining life from God, the Zoe life of God. And so can I ask you all to please lift up your hands with me. Father in heaven, we pray. Thank you that you are the light of the world. And since you are the light of the world, in you there is life. You are life to us, God. Father, thank you that our life or us having a life is not dependent on our possessions, what we have. Lord, but our life is dependent on you and you are our life. And so I pray, let the sustaining grace of God be upon every single family, every person here in this room, Lord. May the spirit empowerment that comes from you be so real in us, Lord. As we look forward to 2019, Lord. As we look forward to the things that our families will do next year. Lord, thank you that it is you who will cause us, Lord, to experience your life more and more. And we receive it by faith. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give God a praise. Before you leave. I believe God deserves our worship. I believe God deserves our praise. Amen. And so let's take this next few moments just to celebrate and appreciate Jesus as the light of our lives.
Lord, as we dismiss today, I pray, Lord, that the blessing of God, the peace of God, the grace of our Lord be upon every single family, every single person here in this room. I pray, Lord, that this week will be a week full of meaning, reason with you, Lord, the logos living inside of us and living with us. I pray that may this week, Lord God, be a week, Lord, where your life will sustain us, will, will, will rejuvenate us and give us the strength, Lord, to be triumphant even this week, Lord. God, thank you. We receive this all in the powerful name of our Lord Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen.